Hello. Well, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to be able to lecture on a topic, or even a title, chosen by Manley Hall. He has a very fine knack for choosing details that make interesting lecturing. So let's consider for a moment the title of this morning's lecture, Marriage in the New World Order. First of all, we must define what we mean by a new world order. There's a lot of talk going on about what the future is going to look like, and we've got, as always, a spectrum of opinions. On one side, we have the pessimists. The pessimists tell us, nope, it's going to be ugly. There's not going to be any new age. There's going to be a nuclear war. Or, even worse, there's going to be a conservative revolution in this country, and people like us are going to be outlawed hear rumors like that. Then on the other side, you hear people who say, no, not at all. On the contrary, we're about to enter the new age, the Aquarian age, the coming of the Christ. And everything will change in the twinkling of an eye and we'll be living in paradise. And then, of course, there are those in between who tell us, and perhaps they're the true pessimists, that no, nothing's going to change. It's going to be just like it always was. But let's consider for a moment what the new world order is for us. Instead of getting into vagaries about what society is going to look like or what our political system might be, let's discuss what it means for metaphysicians. And let's take both extremes. So let's start out with a good one. Obviously, if we do have a new age, if it's true that some form of spiritual energy is now suffusing the earth that hasn't in the past and that sort of thing, well, It'll be a lovely place to live, won't it? Because the philosophy of the world then will in some certain sense be the philosophy of the way. And what I mean by the way is seeking enlightenment, seeking contact with God, seeking greater self-understanding and self-unfoldment. That, of course, would mean that we would have a much more peaceful world than we do now. And we, as seekers of the way, would feel much more productive, much more a part of our world, we'd perhaps be able to contribute to the establishment of a brand new, truly creative order of things. The first time in history when human beings consciously set about creating a world order instead of doing it out of greed or unconscious aggression, that sort of thing. But what about the other extreme? Well, nuclear war sort of lets us out of the whole thing. You know, Then we get to go back into the spirit world and see what we did wrong. But what about the possibility of a conservative backlash? Now, some of you may be aware of the fact, excuse me, that we are seeing right now a very powerful approach by the Christian right into politics. They've targeted 1988 elections as a time to gain tremendous political power in our nation, and many people are nervous about this. Now, I would like to state that, first of all, as metaphysicians or as seekers of the way, we should know better than to be nervous, because if something is happening, it's happening for a reason. And what we need to do, instead of being frightened by it, is to examine the reason and then see how we may respond to it. So perhaps we are seeing a move toward conservatism. Certainly it's indicated astrologically. Astrologers in the audience will recognize that Neptune is in Capricorn right now, and that tends to bring about a conservative strain in things. If you look into history, you'll find that usually great outbursts, great renaissances, are preceded by a period of conservatism. Now, in the past, these periods took hundreds of years, but these days things are moving very fast. And it is possible that, yes, there will be some form of a renaissance, a, quote, new age in the offing, but before we get there, we need to get conservative, withdraw a little bit, retract, kind of get our foundation set again, and then we can move on from there. Remember that all things in life move, as alchemy shows us, through balance and counterpoint. One rises a little, the other falls a little, then the next rises, everything moves this way. So there's nothing to be afraid of then in seeing a movement toward conservatism. What happens though if we discover that indeed laws are passed as they have been in Phoenix and in other areas of the country already and institutions that are devoted to metaphysical studies lose their tax exemption, they become in a sense suspect. The very worst thing that can happen, the very worst thing is that the seeking for the way goes underground. Now think about this for a minute. When we read about the initiates, when we read about the mystery tradition, in all but the very minority of cases, 
We're talking about secret societies. Yes, we had the Eleusinian mysteries, we had the Bacchic mysteries. These were state mysteries. They were very acceptable to everyone who lived at that time. But all through the medieval period, all through the growth of India, on and on and on, we see secret societies. The Rosicrucians were secret societies. The alchemists were, in a sense, a secret society. What is a secret society? Well, imagine this. What are we, after all, as seekers? We are people who wish to discover the essence <coughs> within ourselves, who wish to discover the immortality or the eternity that exists within us. And most of us just have, because of taste or inclination or background, the desire to find it in unusual ways. We're not content to go to the normal kind of path that's laid out in churches and temples and established religions. We want to find it our own way. We want to be involved in that seeking. If there's no room for that sort of activity, then something very simple happens. It's not that it's given up, that everybody in the world stops doing it. What happens is that people who are really dedicated do it quietly. They keep their little books under their floorboards. If you know your Kabbalah and your astrology and your tarot, you don't need anything except your finger and some sand or dirt to write in. And you can teach everything that metaphysics, Kabbalah, alchemy, all of them ever had to tell you. So what will happen then if we do see a kind of conservative period when we all have to go underground is those of us who really aren't dedicated, who are kind of flirting, will stop flirting because it won't be worth the risk. And those who are dedicated, who have a passion for this, will continue to have a passion. And what we will see is a purification of the tradition, a strengthening of it. Now, this is very beautiful if you stop to think about it for a moment, because what is really happening if we think about this is that you can't lose. Either way it goes, the tradition, the way, improves. If it becomes worldwide, well, that's the goal after all that's been enunciated for it since the beginning. If it has to go down underground to any degree again, it strengthens, it becomes purified, it gets stronger than it ever was before. Either way, then, a sincere seeker has nothing to fear from the future. So the new order, then, I would suggest to you, is something that will have to combine both those elements. What, then, is common to a world that is suddenly suffused with people seeking the way and a world in which the way is outlawed as being deviltry? I think that in both, what you're dealing with is very high stakes. In a sense, we've all been in a position of luxury these last few decades. We're allowed to practice what we preach. We're allowed to read what we want to. All the books are available. We can go sit in lectures and hear about it. But we're not terrifically involved in the government of the world. We're in the position of being able to sit back and say, I don't like this. This should not be done. And that, that, that depresses me. This is pretty good over here. Now, what if we're in the position where we're deciding what has to happen? All of a sudden, your belief system is put to a real test. All of a sudden, you've got tremendous responsibilities. And the same thing is true the other way. If the tradition has been condensed and become silent and secret again, those people who are truly dedicated to it, they also have a tremendous responsibility. And what's more, in both cases, there's a tremendous social responsibility. In a sense, either way it goes, we're seeing the end of the me era. Either we will become public and try to help create a new world, or we will become secret and try to keep the tradition alive and strong. Either way, it's not for us alone. It's for everyone, for the future and for the existing generations as well. So. The idea here, then, is that we need to learn cooperation of a sort. That cooperation exists on several levels. And now we're getting to the second word, or the second definition in our title, and that is marriage. What is marriage, as it's understood in this title? You know, there's all kinds of different definitions here, a word that simple. To many people, marriage is exactly the same thing as living with somebody or just going to bed with somebody, except it's legal. That is not marriage. Marriage is an entirely different thing. Marriage is what happens 
when a male and female, symbolizing a very important polarity, stand before a hierophant symbolizing God, and that hierophant declares that this male and female polarity are joined, they are one. It has a symbolic value because, first of all, it's a symbol of the hermetic marriage. And we'll talk about that in depth. But it's also a symbol of two bodies with one soul. In the tradition, there isn't a lot of talk about how two people work together on the path. And those of us who have recently become involved, and by recently I mean the last 10 years, have been watching a rather hair-raising thing. And that is that a lot of marriages are breaking up, apparently, because people are seeking different things and seeking in opposite directions. And there tends to be a feeling that, well, maybe marriage itself is not really an institution that will fit into the so-called Aquarian age. Again, a profound misunderstanding of marriage, the result of our cultural bias toward individual satisfactions. Most of us don't even understand how two people can function as a unit. On what levels does that work? Don't we have to have our own independence, our individuality, all those kinds of considerations pop up to worry us? What we're going to do then is spend a good part of the lecture discussing a relationship's fruition into marriage. Now, what we're discussing here is an ideal. And I don't mean by that that it's the way it should happen if it was going to be romantic and perfect. I mean an ideal in the sense of a pattern, like a geometric, nicely symmetrical. You can hang your own perceptions on it. It's not intended to be a description of the way it happens. It's intended to be something which all of you, from your differing perspectives, can recognize parts of yourselves in. And what I hope to do is, going up and down our little design of a relationship, we'll show just how two people can work on the path. And I think that that is what the marriage in the New World Order is. It's two people working together for enlightenment. It's not just me by myself looking for enlightenment anymore. Now it's how can I and my wife or I and my husband find enlightenment together, experience it together. Now I'd like to stop for a moment and add that this is not completely unknown. That, for example, in the tradition of alchemy, there are really very few adepts in alchemy who have a lovely life story. Normally when you read about alchemists, they end something like this. And then he went to prison where he lived in filth and was chewed on by rats for 50 years and fell out a window and died. Very depressing. <laughs> but there's one guy, one fellow, who stands out, shines like gold. He's the philosopher's stone among alchemists. He's the only one who made it. And his name was Nicholas Flamel. He was supposed to have taken a book called the Book of Abraham the Jew, full of alchemical and Kabbalistic symbols, and figured it out. And as a result, he was able, it is said, to make gold and to extend his life, and he disappeared and was seen in the Orient 200 years after he died, one of those wonderful stories. Why is he different than the others? Yes, you guessed it, his wife, Purnell. They worked together. They solved the Philosopher's Stone together. This is one of the few examples. Now we have another example that's a little more romantic, a little less cheerful. <laughs> And that's the example of Thomas Vaughan, who some of you may have heard of, who was a Rosicrucian, an alchemist in England, alleged Rosicrucian. He and his wife also, Rebecca, were very involved together in the path. They unfortunately died rather young, but had a rather beautiful life with deep understanding in it, irregardless. So there are examples in history, and when we get into artists' lives, and I think that artists are certainly seekers, although some of them don't know it, but usually, again, we find tremendous rapport, tremendous cooperation between the wife and the artist, or the artist and the husband. So there are examples. Now, let's do our little journey. Our journey is going to have seven levels. We're going to start, then, on level number seven and work our way up to level number one. And we're going to be dividing our consideration into three parts. They will be the body, the heart, emotions, and the mind thought. So let's start out and say that usually when a relationship begins, when it commences, there's a period of some form of attraction, 
kind of chemical thing. It can be almost an animal magnetism where there's just this, I looked, looked across the room and I fell in love instantly, that sort of thing. Or it can be just a comfort, a feeling of, I like this person, I like to be around them, that sort of thing. But it's rather unconscious, it's rather nonverbal, it's just a feeling that we have. Now, most of us focus on that aspect. We say, oh, I want to be around this person, and we miss a very important facet of the beginning of relationships, and that is that a terrific purging, a destructive kind of thing, usually happens at the beginning of relationships. And on the body level, it's very simple. It's like this. Oh, boy, I better start doing my sit-ups. I better start doing my push-ups. I want to look good. And, kind of dress a little better and you start to really be concerned about that. You want to get rid of the unnecessary stuff and be as pure and balanced as you can because you want to make a good impression. The same thing is true on the emotional level and you usually find it in these conversations where a person will say something to you like, oh yes, I think that what happened with our bombing Libya was terrible and you've been waving flags out on Sunset Boulevard saying, kill the Libyans and all of a sudden you say, yeah, maybe it wasn't. And you mean it, because you want to understand their perspective. You want to share that with them. So you start purging yourself of emotions that you haven't really examined. And then on the mental level, the same thing happens. You have ideas about things. So for example, you feel that of all the forms of the way, Zen is the worst. That's all there is to it. Zen is what like crazy former dope addicts do. And all of a sudden, this person whom you admire wildly and you're feeling in love with says to you, I practiced Zen for 20 years and it changed my whole life. <laughs> so you decide, well, maybe my opinion about Zen isn't exactly accurate. I should check into it. <laughs> that purging process should continue all the way through the relationship, through the marriage. That is an essential part of the alchemy of creating an enlightened, balanced state of being. And the beauty of a relationship, as we will see, of a hermetic marriage is that here is one person with whom you can bear the ugliest parts of yourself. A person with whom you can examine anything. That's very important. We'll see that as we continue. So after that level, we move up to the sixth level. And this might be called sexual creativity. I don't mean physical sexuality, I mean bipolar creativity. On a body level, it obviously has to do with sexual play and the creativity involved there. And it behooves us to remember that in India, there are traditions in which sexuality is a kind of sacred dance. And that too can become a means toward achieving enlightenment. And so it's good to keep that in mind. It's not just for fun or neurosis, depending on which side of the angle you're on. <laughs> We then, though, consider the heart level of bipolar creativity. This is a kind of emotional game playing. When it's bad, and this happens way too often, it's when I act exactly the way I know will really make you mad. Sometimes I'm not even fully conscious of it, I just do it. And you then, returning the favor, act in a way that you know will enrage me. And you can see this is a kind of bipolar creativity going on here on an emotional level. At best, it's this delightful, childlike game playing of trading delight and laughter with each other, pointing out funny things and shocking each other and mocking each other in a very friendly, trickstery kind of way. There's a lot of that. That kind of emotional playing is very important. When and you know when it recedes into this kind of nasty game playing, you know, the old, I mean, one of the best ones I ever ran into was a woman who used to argue with her husband to take out the garbage. And then after she took out the garbage, she would come back in and call up her friends and say, it's terrible here, he makes me take out the garbage. And of course, made sure he was in the room to hear this. It was a wonderful little game. When that sort of thing happens though, you must bring the feelings out into the open. Don't symbolize through this game. Instead, say very succinctly, clearly, honestly, if you can be relaxed when you do it, what's bothering you. That dialogue is very important. Let the game playing exist only for fun. Let it be a way of discovering each other, of constantly discovering a sense of joy in each other. Because all creation plays, all creation has a game or dance-like element to it. And a relationship should be, in a sense, a microcosm of the creation. 
And then, of course, there are games on the mental level. And one good example would be something like, well, you've just finished reading The Secret Teachings of All Ages, and you are very proud of yourself. So you come walking out, your wife or husband's in the kitchen, they're doing something, and you say, well, I finished The Secret Teachings. You can't help feeling superior because they've never even opened The Secret Teachings. They're not even interested in it. And you start to give them this lengthy rundown, you know, in 500 words or less, what's in The Secret Teachings, which is usually is pretty garbled. And then they respond with, I don't need books. <laughs> Crushing you completely. That's a kind of game playing, too, on the intellectual level. And again, that should be fun game playing. That should be you notice something really strange when you went to the store. Just an interesting little image or metaphor, an interaction between two people. So you bring it home, and you choose just the right moment to present it to your mate, make it kind of humorous. And then they happen to notice something, and they, in turn, present it to you. That sort of thing. It can be a lot of fun. You share insights, in other words, but you do it in a playful fashion, not in this serious, dour kind of thing. I mean, let it be known forever that those seeking must have a sense of humor. Those who find always have a sense of humor. <laughs> if you're very serious about it, barking up the wrong tree. It's got to include all the emotions, sadness, joy, everything. So now we can move up to the next level, and that's the fifth level. And now we're getting a little bit closer toward our marriage. At the fifth level, we're dealing with security. Up until now, we've sort of been having fun. If you think about it, what we've just been describing, it could be a kind of fun romance. We met, we had a wild fling. At this point, it's no longer a wild fling. At this point, it's, I want security on several levels. First again, on the physical level. Now this can mean many things today. In today's age of new and unusual forms of venereal disease, security can simply be, please, let's just uh, be faithful to each other and keep our fingers crossed. It can also be a feeling of, I want to be able to feel with this person, that I can explore my own sexual feelings, both negative and positive, and they can explore theirs. In order to do that, I must have a sense of commitment, a sense of security. I don't want to feel like I'm being compared to other people. I want to feel like I'm me, they're who they are, and we need to have a kind of communication on that level. And here, sometimes, unfortunately, people run for the hills. When you reach the stage of wanting security, some people are so pathologically afraid of sharing security with somebody else, they want to be secure by themselves, that they're unable to open up to that level, which is rather tragic, as you'll see, because they lose all the rest of the picture that we're now going to enter. On the emotional level, the desire for security is very, very important. Let's face it, a lot of us feel we judge ourselves in terms of our mates, in terms of who can we attract, how intelligent, how beautiful, how much do we care about them, that kind of stuff. That's a superficial level of something that goes very deep. And the deepness of that is that we are choosing, whether we know it or not, somebody with whom we are going to walk down life's path. Life's path is seeking. In other words, we're choosing a partner who will make, help make our lives successful or unsuccessful in terms of our material success, our spiritual development. I mean, every single aspect. Emotionally, then, usually when we enter a relationship, we're carrying around a lot of baggage. We're carrying around a lot of old relationships that didn't work, perhaps, or things that our parents or our teachers or our friends told us that upset us terribly. Insecurities, fears, all this stuff. Egotism, on the other hand, feelings of grandeur, all that's in here. Usually it doesn't rub up against other people until you get into a committed relationship. And then all of a sudden, this is the famous thing, you get married and the romance ends. It's a way of saying this. All of a sudden, you start to really see the other person and you start to realize that they're really seeing you. And this is very important for self-purification because you see the other person now, beyond being in another essential God self that you're having communication with, is also a mirror. Because you will notice if you're aware that they'll start to pick up your bad habits. Very suddenly they pick up your good ones. And you will start to pick up their bad habits and there's this kind of crisscross going on. 
Now, if that's dealt with consciously, in other words, if when this begins to happen, you don't say, uh-oh, it's getting a little heavy here for me. I don't think I like it. But instead you say, all right, it seems that in the natural flow of the relationship, we are now reaching a position where we need a feeling of emotional security with each other. So let's make an effort to give each other that. Let's make some form of commitment. If it isn't marriage, at least let it be assurance that no matter what you say or do, I will do my best to understand, to accept it, to love unconditionally. I'm merely human. I may get angry at times. I may get really angry at times, but I will try to let you be you, and I want you to show me all of you. Now, some people say, yes, but then all the mystery is gone. Not true. You're dealing with an infinite. Every human being is infinite. The mind is infinite. The heart is infinite. Memory is infinite. There's no way you will ever exhaust another person. But the more you learn about them, the better for them, the better for you. You discover more about yourself, and they discover the things they were afraid to show. There's nothing wrong with those things. That Once they're shown, they're not so evil and cathected and infected anymore. All of a sudden, they're just little human problems, little you know, oddities. Everybody has them. And once they're put out on the table, they don't look so evil anymore. And then security on the mental level, finally. This is very important and often neglected, unfortunately. What that means is very simple. Usually in a relationship, you find one person who is kind of the intellectual dictator. They're the ones who say, you did that all wrong. That was ridiculous. Wherever they are, you know, kitchen, bathroom, library, doesn't matter. Let me do that that sort of attitude. They feel that they're so much wiser, so much quicker, so much more intelligent that they should be doing all this stuff and maybe you and your horrible ignorance will be able to learn by watching them. That's got to go right away because first of all, a true sage realizes that everybody is a true sage. There isn't a person in the world you can't learn something from. And the best way to learn from somebody is to let them be themselves, to let them do what they do at their own pace, in their own style, and watch. Because you may discover, yeah, they do it slowly, but you know what? They do it better. They have an angle on it that's better than my angle. Or, maybe even more beautiful, they do it slowly, but they enjoy it. They get pleasure out of it. And I'm miserable all the time. I'm a neurotic wretch. <laughs> so, you don't want to bring intellectual superiority in the picture. You want it to be a give and take. Sometimes I'm intellectually superior. Sometimes you are intellectually superior, and we help each other grow that way. Sometimes you bring me back down to earth. Sometimes I take you up into the sky, that sort of thing. Very important, that give and take. But now we've reached a point where, at the very least, the specter of marriage is in the air. Now, with some people, this is met with joy. There's talk about, well, how are we going to do this? How are we going to get married? With other people, this is a time of panic. Nobody brings it up. <laughs> In my own case, it was the latter example, and it was rather amusing because I spent about a oh, year or two avoiding any talk of marriage. And I mean any talk. I mean, if it was on TV, I changed the channel. <laughs> you did not want to bring this subject up. And then one day, I kind of woke up and said, this is ridiculous. I'm absolutely in love with this woman. I want to marry her. And then she started to run away for about a year and said, oh, no, I don't want to talk about marriage. <laughs> so that is definitely a part of our cultural upbringing or our cultural psychological tuning. But once you get past that specter and you decide to do something about it, you reach the next level, and that is the level of bonding. Now, some might argue that marriage is not necessary for this, and what they will say is, look, marriage is a piece of paper that the government gives you, that sort of thing. Yes, that's what secular marriage is. Real marriage isn't that. Let's go back to the image that I gave you earlier on. Real marriage is when two people representing male and female polarities who have decided to join their lives stand in front of a hierophant, a person who is understood to be the voice of deity because they have earned that level of sageliness. And that hierophant, that voice of God says, you two souls are now joined. My experience was, actually our experience was, that when you first get up there and all your friends are there and your relatives and all that, and you see the hierophant up there, in our case it was Manly Hall, you think, oh, this is, isn't this fun? Isn't this interesting? Isn't this? And then often you get up there 
And of course, Manley Hall helps a lot because he's got that big, you know, his blue eyes and everything. And there he was in his robe with his cross, and all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, <laughs> this isn't just nice, this is something else. There was a numinous feeling about it. And when the words are said, and you say, I do, and all those little magic words that have been said millions of times are said, you realize that you are this high in a ritual. And this is a powerful ritual if it's done seriously. And that is a ritual of bonding. And that's the next level. So now we reach physical bonding. Physical bonding is very simple. It means you have decided which pair of bodies is your alchemical retort. You are now off limits to the world. This is not because of some legal or moralistic aspect. It is because, as any good alchemist will tell you, if you've got too much stuff in your laboratory, you can't get anything done. And what you are attempting to do is to generate an energy, the energy of enlightenment. So you and this other person now will physically limit yourselves to each other, will try to be as creative and as sacred in your approach to these things and as joyful as possible, and you will begin to see an energy generated. You will begin to see an energy of transformation, and you will very quickly realize that if you were to be unfaithful, there would be an additional type of energy added that you probably don't want to be dealing with. I don't necessarily mean even negative, just a different kind of energy. On the emotional level, the bonding is very simple. It's the kind of bonding that Gandhi did when he vowed to his wife, and it goes something like this. I am with you until the end. That's the marriage vow. Until death, you and I are going to work on this experiment together. Now, I'm not saying that you make a mistake and then you stick it out to the rest of your life. What I'm hoping is that each of you as seekers will be aware enough that if you are going to get married, or if you already have, that you have chosen or will choose the right partner, and you'll be careful about that. You'll check all the levels before you get involved that deeply. But having done that, you now have this commitment. Now this becomes a rock foundation. This is unbelievable, very difficult to describe if you haven't experienced it, because you know that no matter what happens, you can trust this other person. And they are there and will save you at times, and vice versa. Tremendous feeling of security. When you do something outrageously stupid, I mean amazingly stupid, and feel just, oh God, I can't even face life anymore, they're there. And they're the one person who doesn't take you to task for it, who still cares. You see it in their eyes, you see it in the way they respond to you. This is so important because the path is a very up and down kind of thing. It's got a lot of times when you get there and you're thinking, boy, I'm this close. Boy, I can feel it. I'm really an enlightened kind of guy. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh no, and you see what a fool you've been. That happens a lot. You have to get used to it. And it's nice to have somebody you can share that with you and say, you know, I did the same thing. Remember when I did that? And you say, oh yeah, that's right. Very important. And then, of course, on the mental level. Now, this is very important because, you see, one of the beauties about the path is that it's full of paradox. When you go through Zen or you go through alchemy, whatever it is, paradox everywhere. You wind up thinking about things like this. Well, let's see, if God's in everything, well, maybe God is everything. Okay, well, then you're all God and I'm God, but wait a minute, but we're different, though, so how can we all be, you get into this kind of stuff. Now, of course, you could be put in a madhouse if you talk about this to the wrong kind of people. And if you get into it real heavy, you find yourself floating out in the ozone sometimes, and you may spend a day, a week, a month just not quite there, and somebody has to watch over you a little bit. You know, you leave your keys on top of the car, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Here's a person, then, that you can share your weirdest ideas with. You can say, you know, I was thinking about this, and it's just the weirdest thing. I don't understand. Now, a new dimension enters here with the bonding. You are now one soul, two bodies. Remember we said that now? We don't mean one little personality in two bodies. We mean one infinite soul in two bodies. And what you'll find is that the law of polarity will start to work. And what will happen is you'll come up with this insane idea. And you'll be thinking about it and thinking about it, and you'll read about it in books, and you'll be thinking, is this possible? I mean, I'm not understanding this, apparently. It couldn't be this weird. And then you walk out over to the kitchen, in my case, and then there's a little board up there with the 
shopping list on it, and next to shopping list is a single sentence, just an idea, and that sentence is the answer to your question. Oh, that's what I was doing wrong. In other words, you discover that, or I've discovered that, my wife is on the same beam as I am, even though we're not talking, and has come up with the thing that I'm missing. This happens every single day. And it happens in all marriages that are an attempt to work together toward enlightenment. It's just automatic. It's like an archetype that begins to function. And that's a wonderful thing, because as long as you've got that balance going, nobody is going to get too excessive. When they get a little too pragmatic, you make them a little idealistic. When you get a little too idealistic, they make you a little more pragmatic. And sometimes you shift roles. I hope you can see what tremendous flexibility this gives you. Because all of a sudden, you have not just your virtues, you have your partner's virtues as well. And that makes you as strong as two people. And one of you can be somewhere, but both of you are there. Now, at this point in the bonding, sometimes even earlier in a very powerful relationship, you will discover a whole slew of these kinds of experiences, and usually with great delight. So, for instance, you get the old, both of you open your mouths at the same time and say the same thing. And it happens two or three times a day and you start laughing. Gee, we're on the same. That gets boring after a while, though. <laughs> you discover that your dreams interconnect in a certain way. You discover that they seem to dream the same thing, but cloaked it in a different symbolic language than you did. And when you compare your dreams, they unlock each other. All sorts of fun things like that start to happen. Because, again, you've created a kind of alchemical retort a little kind of bottle in which you're cooking up both of you. And if you've ever seen the alchemical drawings, you sometimes see a king and queen in rather, I would say, racy position for those times. And there is the idea then of, yes, you know, the Jungian, the anima, and then the person, the male-female blending, but take it literally, too. Two people together rising up on the path. So we've gone through our bonding then, and now we're at a level we might call choices. Odd thing is that even couples who have gotten this far sometimes stumble on choices. They forget they have choices. They forget that, oh, right, now we can start all over again. We've got two of us. We can work together. What do we want to accomplish? Physical level choices, besides the different forms of sexuality that we as a couple will explore, also includes what kind of career will we or I or you be involved in? Where will we live? Do we want to leave where we are now? A lot of people, for example, and I've lectured on this, are not real happy about living in the city. There's a kind of exodus, in fact, going on into other areas, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, this sort of thing. Why? Because it's, it is difficult to live in the city. You're being bombarded with ideas and noise and people and tension and all that, and it can be very tiring. And it can be very hard to open yourself, make yourself naked to infinity, which is what the path is about in an environment that's constantly bombarding you with painful things. So at the very least, you want to look at the idea of, well, if we don't want to move, maybe we do want to have a little vacation spot somewhere that's cheap enough for us to afford, that we can retreat to once in a while. In other words, you want to become conscious about what you're doing physically. You want to become conscious about your environment, about the way you dress, instead of, well, let's see, you've got the dishes and I've got the Polynesian art, let's put them all together. Maybe you get rid of everything <laughs> and you start with something fresh. You decide, well, let's get a different thing here. Let's paint the walls a funny color, a color that's inspiring, that's stimulating. Let's get some flowers around here. And you work together to find a beautiful environment. And a beautiful environment in every way. Physically, clothing, house, place you live, career, creativity, all that stuff. And you work together to make the choices. You discuss what you would like together to accomplish. And you will find, again, maybe more than nine times out of ten, that when you two work together on it, you come up with better decisions because it's a more holistic approach. So then we rise up to emotional choices, friendships. Very often when a bonding relationship starts, strange thing happens. You've had friends all the way through. You know, you've had a 30-year courtship, you're conservative. <laughs> and all of your friends have been with you all through it, you know, friends since childhood. And then all of a sudden you get married and they're gone. And you can't figure it out. 
there is a different energy. There's a different chemistry going on. And sometimes what happens is that very old friends drop off and people you never thought could be your friends suddenly gravitate into the aura. Now you want to be conscious in your choices about this. All of us on the path have a kind of martyrdom complex. We, every time we see even the slightest bit of suffering, we say, I'm personally responsible. I have to help this person. And as Mr. Hollis said, no good deed goes unpunished. Usually when we do that, we really get ourselves messed up. <laughs> so we need to work together at that point, and that works very well, because normally you will find that one partner mirroring the Kabbalistic tree is severe, and the other one is merciful. And the merciful one is sort of the good old Joe who wants to get involved with everybody and help everybody out. And the other one's the one who says, I don't want to help anybody. Keep them out of my life. And when the two of them work together, you get a nice balance. It's a little phrase that can be gleaned from the Kabbalah, very important, is poise contemplates severity. Always remember that as mystics. Poise contemplates severity. Always think about it at the very least. Poise is what you're hoping to accomplish then emotionally. You want to become as a unit, as a couple, and individually poised human beings emotionally. You want to learn to balance your emotions in such a way that you're no longer a manic depressive. And you can do this with each other. So what you try to do is, and usually what happens of course in the beginning is that you feel depressed, so you go running to your mate and they're depressed too and you're both depressed together. But after a while, the cycle shifts a little bit, and you're depressed, and they sort of pull themselves out of the depression, and they help you pull out of it, and the next time, you, you're still depressed, but they come over and are depressed, and you say, no, I'm not going to share depression. Instead, I'm going to do my best to cheer them up. And next thing you know, you've got this thing going on, and a wonderful, almost like a hum, it's like an energy of cheerfulness begins to pervade the atmosphere. And then we have choices on the mental level. This is, again, mental choice is very important on the path. Which way are we going to go? Where are we attracted? What are we going to study? Are we going to study the same things or different things? Will they be complementary? Can we live together with them? I mean, if you want to be a Baptist Christian and I want to be a hell's angel worshiping Satan, you know, this could be a severe problem. Maybe we should reconsider and find something a little bit in between. And that brings us to something that is essential, maybe the most important thing I will say in this lecture in terms of hermetic marriage relationships. Those of you who think that sticking to your spiritual path is more important than preserving the love you share with somebody, think again. Love is more important. Love is the spiritual path. And if you want to understand alchemy, one thing you could say is, you don't make the philosopher's stone until you have learned to love another more than yourself. All spiritual paths have a little bit of ego in them. You have to recognize that. They all do. They're all kind of special, you know? You're on your way to something. And when you have love for another person and you perceive, wait a minute, my growth is threatened here on this path, and you cut this other person off, You've done two things. First of all, you've chosen an idea over a living human being. Bad taste. You've chosen idea over emotion. Not good either. And worst of all, you've shown lack of faith in God. Because if you're supposed to be enlightened, you'll be enlightened. You don't need to follow one path. The path is what you live day by day. And cutting off people because they disagree with you is not walking on the path. The path is less in ideas and less in getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning to meditate and never eating eggs than it is in knowing how to deal with people and to open your heart to them and with them. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. So when choosing then what kind of mental adventure you will embark on, the first thing you want to consider is that it is indeed an adventure. And you might consider where the word adventure comes from. It comes from the Latin adventura, which means something's about to happen. And every good path is like that. It makes life an adventure. It means that something's about to happen. When you open up this particular book you love, you know there's going to be a mind-exploding discovery. When you go out into the world and you begin to see how everything has a kind of symbolism, an archetypal interrelationship, and you recognize these things, life becomes very exciting. 
So you want to choose a path or paths that you can share this way. And sometimes you can choose complementary ones. So for example, if you happen to have a passion for some odd reason for alchemy and Kabbalah, I do, so don't feel bad. In other words, for the absolutely most complicated approaches to these matters, then perhaps your mate isn't drawn in that direction. They're drawn to a much simpler approach. Wonderful. The key then is for you to boil your stuff down to a level where you can communicate and for them to boil their stuff down to a level where they can communicate. And the two of you can see that both paths are really the same because all paths are the same. They all have the same heart. And now instead of you by yourself trying to prove that, you've got a partner proving it with you. And of course at the same time you're refining, you're editing, you're discovering that I don't know what the author meant here but it sure doesn't seem to work. You can share that insight with somebody else. And now we get up to the most magical level. And that level has to do with, well, let's call it a kind of spiritual blending. This is when sorts of eerie things start to happen. And we discuss the dreams, and we discuss that sort of thing. But now we want to work with it. So on the physical level, at this point, we are now going to make our physical lives as a team serve our purpose, which is gaining enlightenment. That means that we now begin to look at our diet. We now begin to look at our exercise. We now begin to look at our sexuality. We want to make out of all of these things a spiritual path. We don't eat a certain diet because that's what it says in the book. We experiment. We eat a certain diet because what we want is clarity and balance and we start to pay attention to what we eat. We start to notice that every time I eat chicken, I feel funny. I don't mean physically funny, I mean emotionally funny. That may sound crazy, but it happens every time I eat chicken. Well, don't go to the doctor. Stop eating chicken. Chicken has hormones in it. Maybe it's affecting your hormonal balance. Same thing with sleeping. Same thing with exercising. If you want to be on the path, you want to be as healthy as you can be. You want to be as clear and as balanced. So you start to work together on that. You try to make then these aspects of your life as sacred as you can. Then you rise up to the emotional level and you want to do the same thing. This does not mean that you're editing experience. It doesn't mean that, oh, 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 I had a bad thought or I had a bad feeling. Well, I won't talk about it. On the contrary, you're now going to be deep sea divers in your emotions. Um, excuse me, for the next week I'm going deep sea diving, so keep an eye out for me, please. Fine. Sometimes you drag each other down, by the way, but that's interesting because you're both at the ocean floor picking things up. The idea here is you want to discover who you are. What made, just as an example, Shakespeare such a tremendous genius wasn't that he had a really glib tongue. It was that he looked into every demon and angel inside himself. And then when he came to write about demons and angels in human form, he wrote about them beautifully, artfully, understandingly. And that's what we need to do with ourselves. We need to sink way down into the depths and discover what's lurking down there. And we sometimes discover very frightening things, things we don't want to face. And those are the things that we pick up and gently bring to our partner and say, this really frightens me, I need to talk about it. And once again, almost every time, you will discover that once it's out and being talked about, you suddenly realize, you know, actually what this is, is something that happened to me when I was 13 years old, and it scared me so bad, I never talked about it. And every once in a while, once a month, it would just pop up, just slightly visible in my consciousness, and I went, <gasps> and I shoved it back down again, and that made it so important. But the minute that I actually said it, I realized it was dumb, and it let go of me. That's a wonderful experience. And then, of course, sometimes you find rather interesting little animals inside that give you a lot of energy, because all the different archetypes, all the different animals inside you, all the different people inside you have energy. They're parts of you. They're part of your energy. And when you say no to them, when you won't allow them a way to cooperate with you, you lose all that energy. So generally, people who are very constricted about themselves, who don't like to give expression to anything but the right thing, those people tend to be kind of <sighs> all the time. 
And what they need to do is to look inside and say, yeah, I'm not crazy about you, but let's figure out a way that you can still be you, but you can work with me. So for example, let's say you have inside you Attila the Hun. And your conversation goes something like this. No, I'm not going to allow you to take over the world and kill people. But maybe there's a way that we can work together. Let's think about this for a moment. Well, you've got a lot of energy, and you're very aggressive, and you're courageous, and I could use that because in my job I want to be a kind of entrepreneur, but it's got to be polite. So how about if I get you together with a diplomat over here, and you guys work together? You know, you're sort of in the background, the diplomat's in front, that sort of thing, and Attila says, okay, and you try it out. And of course, a couple times he rushes out and lops somebody's head off, but you learn to work with the energy instead of suppressing it. This is essential. And then finally, we have the mental level of spiritual blending. That relates to what we've just discussed. It kind of ties it up. And that is that you, what you will normally find is that these archetypes inside you are also inside your mate. They're inside everybody. And what will happen is a kind of dance. Sometimes your Attila pops out their Attila pops out at the same time, and boy, that's fun, let me tell you. <laughs> Other times, you're suppressing your Attila, and their Attila pops out, and you get really angry and severe about it. And if you're smart, you go into your room and shut the door and say, why did I overreact like that? Why wasn't I gentle in the face of anger? Nine times out of ten when I'm overreacting, it's because somebody has done something that I do but don't want to recognize. So you begin to look at all the things that bother you about your mate. And you begin to ask yourself, how am I just like that? And then you begin to apply that most powerful of all spiritual tools. I mean, the most powerful. Do unto others. That is yoga. And yoga means union with God. If you can begin to apply that all the time, if you say instead of, why, you're banging those dishes out there and you're making my meditation living hell, stop it. If instead you think, all right, if I were out there doing the dishes and she were in here meditating, what would I want to happen? Well, maybe what I'd want is not her to yell at me about how the meditation is being disturbed. Maybe I'd like her to come in and help me with the dishes and we could both meditate. You start to think that way. And you want to apply that as much as you can. And if you can't apply it with your mate, you can't apply it with anybody. And in a sense, this is the key to the whole situation. This is what the sacred marriage is about. The sacred marriage is two people saying, okay, let's try it out. If we can make it work with each other, then we can make it work with other people. If we can make do unto others work here, maybe then we can begin to expand it into our life in general. So, we have gone up six levels. There is a seventh level missing, and there's an element to all this missing. We've been talking about the body, and the heart, and the mind. But we're missing the essence. Spirit. And what is the seventh level? Well, Fancy, fancy, we've been going up the chakras. And the seventh chakra is the crown chakra. And that is the crown of spiritual unfolding. So let's review for a moment. We started out with the destructive purging aspect, the process of deciding what parts of ourselves we need to get rid of, what bad habits. That is the lowest chakra. It has to do with expulsion of unneeded energy. Then we got up to bipolar or sexual creativity. Those kinds of lovely games, male-female games, dark and light games. That is the second chakra. Then we got up into the idea of security. Third chakra. Then we got up into the idea of bonding. That's the chakra right here. And you can feel that. When you really love something, when you feel it here, there's a bonding that happens. And we got to the level of choices, throat chakra. We got up to the psychic level, where things begin to blend with archetypes. And now we're up to the seventh level, where it all unfolds into that beautiful shining lotus that represents enlightenment, or in the Western tradition, the rose. 
the open rose. That's the goal of the hermetic marriage, and that's the goal of the New Age order. We tend to forget that that's really what it's all about. Yes, it has a lot to do with making the world a safer place, making it a more beautiful place, making it a place where children don't have to starve. Those are all essential aspects. But in a way, each of us are little cells of the earth attempting to enlighten themselves. And I've sometimes envisioned that it's like this happens in our brains. Maybe the enlightenment process is a gradual thing. Maybe little cells inside you have to get enlightened first. And when enough of them get enlightened, you experience enlightenment. And perhaps this is the case with our Earth as well. It may take thousands of years, who knows how long, but eventually, one hopes, we will have an enlightened humanity. At that point, the Earth will not have to suffer through destruction of the ecology, starvation of children, that sort of thing, because the custodians of the Earth will know how to take care of her. They will be more perfect expressions of balance. And in a sense, then, the Earth will have her enlightened mind. So you can see what we're really discussing here is a tremendous scientific experiment. It's been going on for a long time. It started out basically performed by individuals. A person decided, perhaps in India, that they were going to enter the spiritual path. And they went off and lived with a guru somewhere and studied the sutras. And then they experienced or didn't experience enlightenment. An experiment failed or succeeded. Now, I believe, we're moving to a period, and perhaps this is, this is something that America can gift the world with, where what we're dealing with is not just single people experimenting, but couples experimenting, perhaps even communities experimenting. Now, some of you may know that a lot of the communities involved in New Age work have a lot of trouble. Usually they start out with this kind of glowing idea of what's going to happen, and they get good results at first, and then three or four years down the road you hear disaster has struck, various kinds of disaster, usually infighting. That's because it's very hard to jump like that. It's very hard to start out by yourself, and then suddenly you're dealing with 20 people all seeking enlightenment. All of them have their little problems, all of them have their insecurities and their fears and their egoisms, and it's all going to come to the surface because that's the nature of seeking. In the very beginning of the esoteric instructions that Madame Blavatsky gave to her esoteric school, which are now in print, so I'm not telling you anything you can't find out, she says, and in this lovely 19th century style, which they love drama, you know, beware, O oh student of these mysteries, that sort of thing. But what she got around to saying was, when you get into this stuff, everything bad and good about you explodes and be ready to deal with it. Now, when you've got 20 people exploding, <laughs> whew, it's tough. So maybe the same thing to do is to start out with one, is to enter into a sacred marriage and work with that person. Let the experiment progress slowly. Let's see now if two people can achieve enlightenment together. Let's see if it becomes easier. I can tell you it sure was a lot easier for me. And then that can be spread a little bit further. Now, of course, you've got here a wonderful economy of motion because you've got, in a sense, the archetype or the experience of enlightenment happening to two people at once. Instead of one person who then laboriously tries to get the other person going, you have a very subtle process. In a way, then, you've got a guru-student relationship that is interchangeable and is constantly shifting and is constantly pushing itself and growing to higher levels of expression. It can be very beautiful. Now, let's retreat from all this for a minute and take a different overview and say, now, if there are people in the audience who are single and are now despairing because I've described this wonderful thing and they're thinking, I can't even find somebody to go out with on Saturday night. <laughs> we have to here enter a different level of consideration. And that is, we are where we need to be. If you will be entering into a sacred marriage, all you have to do is be smart enough to recognize it when it comes along. That's it and be nice and careful and quiet about it. And in the meantime, have fun. In the meantime, have careful, sane fun. Explore yourself, 
explore the world, discover things. In the right time, the right person arrives. And usually there's lots of bells go off and all that stuff. It's wonderful the way that's arranged. You just have to have patience and enough awareness to see it. Because what generally tends to happen is most people are romantics. You do find extremes. You find people on one side who are like, I'm marrying somebody with bucks. That's my only criteria. <laughs> And then you find on the other side people who say, marriage, me? Well, I'm much too much a stud to get married, that sort of thing. <laughs> Not many, though. Usually when a person starts out looking for a relationship, the way it starts out is, I want to find that special person. I want to be in love. And then there's a series of disappointments that occur. Some of them start as early as first grade. <laughs> The whole question is, will you allow yourself to be disappointed? It's the same thing on the spiritual path. There are lots of nice, gnarly, ugly disappointments on the spiritual path, and they are the temptations or the tests that we all hear about. Do you have one bad fall and then say, that's it, I'm through with this, this spiritual stuff, it's bad? Or do you say, okay, this could be karma, it could be my own stupidity, it could be anything, but whatever it is, I'm going to stick this out. It's the same thing with a relationship or a hermetic marriage or the search for a relationship. The idea is to stay open, to not allow yourself to get to the point where you say, look, I've been through this too many times. I've been married 27 times. I mean, I'm just, I give it up, you know. All that's telling you is not that every man or woman in the world, whatever your opposite sex is, is an ogre. What it's telling you is you have a discrimination problem. <laughs> and discrimination is one of the most important virtues on the path. You must learn to be able to discriminate between what is right and what is wrong. So now let's take a moment and discuss some aspects of discrimination. These practical things that people face when they are approaching this form of relationship. For those of you who are not in such a relationship, you can take it as notes for the future to keep in mind. And for those of you who are, you'll probably recognize a lot of this. One of the interesting things that happens when you have a bond, when you have that kind of relationship, is that you run into a pressure cooker experience. Normally, because our culture is geared toward making your appetites nice and infected, we grew up with this feeling of, oh, there's lots of beautiful people out there, and I'm going to have lots of relationships and lots of, and all that. And you get into this sort of thing usually before you get married, and then all of a sudden you get married, and now you're not allowed anymore. Maybe you're not even allowed to look, technically speaking. <laughs> and a lot of tensions can arise, and you reach certain cycles in a relationship. Cycles are very important to realize, because normally what happens when a marriage breaks up, if it isn't simply the two people who are worst enemies inside have gotten married, is that like planets, you start out real close and then all of a sudden the orbit shifts a little bit and you start to move away from each other. Now that can simply mean that you spend more time with your friends or you spend more time alone. Some people panic right there. They say, uh-oh, we don't want to be around each other all the time anymore. I need a divorce. You don't. You need to simply relax and let the orbit swing back around again. And you will discover that the orbit spirals. That each time you allow it to go separate, actually you're kind of moving up a triangle. And your separations get closer and closer. And your closeness gets closer and closer. But you have to allow it these swings. So sometimes you get a bad coincidence between cycle and temptation. You feel a little isolated, and you see somebody who just, usually they're the opposite, by the way, of your mate, which immediately warns you to something. You see somebody else, and you think, whoa, what a beautiful, you know, you're staggered. And then, guilt! You know, and you go and you tell your mate, and your mate says, oh, fine, fine, well, they don't handle it at all. And you're feeling like, what have I done? This is horrible. Well, next time around, you're a little wiser. You don't get into this. You don't get into freedom. That's the other side of the Aquarian age. You don't get into, well, if I want to, I mean, aren't feelings important? I mean, maybe, I'm maybe that person is the person I'm supposed to be with. Drop it. You've made your commitment. Instead, 
think of it this way. All right, what am I trying to tell myself? What's being symbolized to me here? Now, those who have gone through this and given in to the temptation will tell you, if you get them at the right moment, what usually happens. They have a wonderfully exciting encounter, and then they look at the other person and, <sighs> what have I done? For what? When those things happen, it's because a projection is going on. I don't mean a projection in a strict Freudian sense. I mean it more in a slangy way. And that is that a certain part of yourself that you are not paying attention to, you have now pushed out on that other person. You're not seeing them. You're seeing a myth. You're seeing a vision of beauty. Now, it was a moment before when you looked at your mate and you saw that vision of beauty. And there will be a moment in the future when you will look at your mate and see that vision of beauty. And you will say, ah, oh, yes, we're you know, the sacred couple. It's beautiful to be able to, to have this mythological rapport. That sort of thing. But now when you look at somebody else, a stranger, and you see that, you think, wow, different level. <laughs> and what you need to do is to pull back and say, all right, let me think about this. First of all, let's back away from the idea that this may be the person I'm supposed to be involved with. Because if it is, guess what? You'll run into them all the time and over and over and over again, and the situation will force you into it. So you get forced kicking the whole way, just to be sure. So forget about that aspect. Instead, say to yourself, what is the symbology going on here? Now, generally, what will be symbolized in an attraction to a member of the opposite sex is some form of relationship with your own spiritual self, anima animus. An example, let us say that you are involved with a person who is a fiery redhead. And all of a sudden you see a demure brunette and have this tremendous feeling of attraction. If you go home and think about it, you may discover, for example, that what's really going on is that you have absorbed a lot of that fiery redhead energy spiritually, that you're really getting in there and you're working and you're active and you've got high aspirations, but you haven't learned any gentleness. You haven't learned humility or modesty. And this person is symbolizing those virtues to you. The great Irish mystic, A.E., George Russell, whose book, The Candle of Vision, I stupendously highly recommend to everyone, has one little phrase that is so important, and it goes like this, desire is identity. The things that you desire, you desire because you identify with them. You find a likeness, even in opposites, because inside you that opposite is lurking. Now you can see that this opens up a whole new level and kind of brings us back to the level of social choices because the obvious next step is the question, all right, let's say we've got the hermetic marriage working. How do we bring friendships into it? How do we help other people? Well, one obvious way is to help them have hermetic marriages by sharing your experiences. But another way is through an awareness of First of all, the symbology at work, helping you to judge what kinds of friendships are at work. So for example, you may like somebody and you may not like them, not because of the person, but because there's a difference of perception going on. There's a different kind of projection. And it's helpful to compare notes on the projection. But then you get past that step and you're now able to deal with another person as another person. This is the goal of the hermetic marriage. This is the goal of the new age order, the new world order. Think about it for a moment. Most of us do not respond to each other. We respond to a haircut, an article of clothing, a certain accent, a choice of words, the kind of car that's driven. Even when we consider ourselves fairly deep and aware, we make these snap judgments all the time. And even when we accept that this is a living human being over here, we forget the infinity of that person. So in general semantics, for example, it's pointed out that when you talk about somebody, you should say, oh, Ron Hogart, 1984, stole money from me. 
Then Ron Hogart, 1986, gave me a phone call to remind you that they're not the same people. They may be the same people, but you've got to check first to find out. And that can apply minute to minute. What we're really trying to do then in opening ourselves up to the essence is at the same time to be aware of other people to their essence. There can be a very beautiful experience, some of you may have had it, where you can look at another person, you look into their eyes, there's a kind of light in everybody's eyes, and suddenly you realize that way down deep in there, behind that body and those ideas and those memories, there's a wonderful, living, gentle essence. And that essence is very much like the essence inside you. And in a way, you and this other person are one. That is a very moving, very important experience to have. And in a true sense, until you are able to look at anybody and have that rapport, until you're able to approach somebody at work or at home or when they need help or on the freeway when their car is wrecked, and be able to see them, I mean the essence, the divinity within, you really can't have a rapport with them. When you do see that essence, you are able to deal with situations that you otherwise could not. You're able to deal with rage. You're able to deal with horrible depression. Because you see, you have fastened onto that infinite life force within that person. And that's what you are attempting to communicate to. And as long as you have that focus, a great deal of good can be done. And beyond that, it's a tremendous feeling to have. It's a tremendous experience. There's an old story about a sage whose name was Apollonius of Tyana. He got a very bad rap from Christianity, much like the Emperor Julian, mainly because one suspects those who recorded Apollonius's story felt that they needed to add some Jesus-like miracles because it made it better. You know, at the time, that was sort of the rage. And, of course, the church turned around and frowned on that and said, no, 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 this, this guy was the Antichrist or the Antichrist of the time. There have been many Antichrists. He wasn't really. He was a Pythagorean. And if you know anything about Pythagoreanism, they're the furthest thing from Antichrist. In fact, they're very Christian-like. They're very pure, very aesthetic kind of people. And there's a story about Apollonius of Tyana that he was going through a period of silence. Pythagoreans were supposed to go through three to seven years of silence, depending on the school. Think about that for a minute. Seven years of not opening your mouth. Never a word. And apparently he came to a riot going on in a major city, and he couldn't say anything. And the story goes that Apollonius simply stood there. And his presence was so powerful that the riot stopped. Now, everybody has their own interpretation of this. People who were into mesmer used to say he had very powerful animal magnetism. It's like he hypnotized the audience. And magicians used to say, oh, yes. He had the mana, he had the magical power, and he just... I suggest to you what was happening was that everybody who happened to glance at this strange guy standing over here, perfectly quiet, and looked into his eyes, saw something. And that something was that Apollonius was looking through their anger. He was looking at the humanity in them. He was looking at, perhaps even further, the divinity in them. His eyes were, no doubt, full of love and peacefulness and, in a sense, of sorrow for what was happening. And that expression, so clearly, so intensely visible, was enough to calm down people one by one until the whole thing just sort of fell apart and calmed. This is an excellent allegory to remember in our times, which are getting a little bit hysterical right now and may get a little more hysterical. One person who is balanced, serene, joyous, loving. It's all it takes because they radiate this around them. And then other people are brought to that same kind of state. That's all the teaching or being a, quote, guru is about. Forget all the doctrines. Those are ways, little tricks, little steps to mount up and down. The main thing is to get to that state where one is so balanced that spirit shines through. And spirit is peacefulness and creativity and love and happiness and all those wonderful things. And each person who radiates that, well, adds another note, another harmonious note 
to the environment. And perhaps then that's what our greatest responsibility toward the new world order is. Learning to be those kind of people. Patient, kind, peaceful. And that is why marriage is such an excellent place to start. Because if you can be gentle and peaceful and kind in your marriage, you can be gentle, peaceful, and kind anywhere. <laughs> and that's true. So, in closing, I would like to leave you with the thought that, in a way, the sacred marriage exists on three levels. At its most mundane level, it's between two people. They symbolize it. At its next level, it's between all human beings and perhaps further still, all life, all existence. All of us are married to one another. We all live in the world together and every little thing we do affects every other little thing. So we're all in a great big marriage. And finally, the sacred marriage is a marriage between you and the divinity within. In the past, all the marriage symbolism, the chemical marriage of Christian Rosenkreuz and all that, all refers to that sacred marriage. It's when the phenomenal self, the consciousness in this world, after all its struggles, suddenly discovers and falls in love with the soul and marries the soul and they are one, bound together for eternity. And that is the achievement of the Philosopher's Stone. That is the achievement of the New World Order. That is the achievement of, you name it, Zen, realization, immortality, eternity, all those lovely words that don't have meaning until that marriage is experienced. So that does our lecture. I would like to make an announcement, and that is I hope you will be with us as a little bit later on at 1.30, there's going to be a wonderful presentation of the works of Thoreau by an actor, Mr. Sneed, who will present to us a show he has done all over the Oregon, Washington, California area. And Thoreau, by the way, if you're not familiar with him, is such a wonderful source, fountain of beautiful ideas and freedom. He was a tremendous influence on Gandhi. And at this time in our slight national chaos, very good person to consider, a very good person to think about, a good energy to contact in terms of ideas. This lecture has been recorded and there are, if you don't know about it, dozens of others that I've done on every subject under the sun to bore yourselves with. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that Mr. Hall couldn't have been here. Goodbye. <laughs>